I wrote a manual in 2015, and it came from a place of my deep and profound love for Christmas, which is unmatched in the entire world. I think my wife claims she loves Christmas more than I do. She's a liar. My parents did maybe the best job in the world of setting the stage for how important Christmas could be, and I would argue should be, in all of our lives. My dad's from Miami, my mom's from Carmel, California, but in 1990, they moved us from South Florida up into rural Nebraska. And for those of you who don't know where that is or what that is, it's one of our 50 states here in the U.S. I think it's the best state in the U.S. Ah, oh, the old Rush Limbaugh book. The town they moved us to, called Lyons, at the time had a population of like 1,200. You're surrounded by quiet and these beautiful rolling fields. My parents put a lot of work into the music that they would play and the stuff my mom would bake and how they would decorate. My dad used to take us out and we would choose a tree and cut down our own Christmas tree every year. Yep, that's for Tony, the dinosaur tree. We as kids, every single year after Thanksgiving, just found ourselves in this constant anticipation of Christmas Day and then this massive letdown after Christmas was over. This this depression and this vacancy of like, oh my God, it's over. We have to wait a whole nother year for this. Tony got his Red Ryder 200 shot range model air rifle. Can I tell you? Can I, can I? The music, I, I don't think I understood until recently how big of a role the music they played in the background had on you. All of my nostalgia is wrapped up in the melodies of Emmanuel. All of the nostalgia and memories I have of these Christmases of my childhood. And there's a sense of longing to try to get back to those places, which I can't do. So there's also sadness I feel. I can't go back to my childhood. I can't go back to that time where my mom was alive and she made Christmas really, really special for all of us as kids growing up. But there's also a sense of joy and beauty and wonder, I think that we all experience when we think back to celebrating the holidays as kids. And so when people have occasionally asked, what were you feeling? What were you experiencing as you were writing this? All I had to do was tap back into those memories. Let's see what you got, Tony. Legos. Oh, Legos. And I got the directions. Great. The very first uh, instrumental music I remember hearing in my life was instrumental Christmas music. And it's from a group called Mannheim Steamroller. They're actually from Nebraska. What they did is they mixed classical orchestral instruments with synthesizers. His version of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, called Veni Veni, absolutely changed my life. I wanted to do my version of it, but I also had this obsession with Carol of the Bells and that very simple repeating melody that I still think John Williams' rendition of in Home Alone will never be matched. I wanted to do my own version of both of these songs, quiet, soft, restrained, but also a beautiful synthesis and had orchestral elements together. And I always imagined them as, as two songs. But as I started writing, they didn't feel exclusive anymore. It felt like it made a lot more sense to blend them together. The final one came in around 15 minutes. And I remember at the time thinking, should I really put a 15 minute long song out? Can people's attention span handle that? Well, clearly the answer is yes, as it has become probably my most listened to song overall. But number two, it's also challenged my understanding of our attention spans. We get told all the time that we need to get to the meat of the song within you know, a good five or 10 seconds. Well, Emmanuel's intro, I think is like 30 seconds of just wind and ambience. It really challenged my perception of what human beings can hold. I didn't set out to make it 15 minutes. It just ended up being that length of time. It felt right. How do I encapsulate my feelings for Christmas into a song? That was one of the challenges with Emmanuel. And I tried to do this actually two other times before Emmanuel came out. I had a, uh, a song called Rise that I did a snowfall remix of. And then I had a song called Dwell that I did a snowfall remix of. And in both of those songs, what I'm trying to do is experiment with softening the tones and textures of the song to sound the way the outdoor sounds after a snowfall. It's extremely quiet, especially as the snow is falling. And you contrast that with how far sound can travel when it's really cold outside. How do I get that? That was my challenge. Hi. Yeah. Well, look what I got. <laughs> 
The people I brought in were really important. I needed to bring in an incredible vocalist or two, and then a few really talented string players. I actually sketched out all the production on my Yamaha P22 piano and recorded everything I wanted to record, and then had uh, my friend Maggie Lander come in. Though Maggie plays violin, she does it in a more improvisational, playful way. Let's call it fiddle playing. And her voice has this unbelievably rich tone. And Maggie came in for three or four sessions and gave me quite a few passes on the fiddle, but then also quite a few passes with her voice. And everything you hear in the track, uh, violin-wise, is Maggie just improvising. Then I thought, who do I get for the low strings? I don't want viola, I don't want a stand-up bass, I want cello. And I had known Chris Coleman at that point for a few years. Chris's cello tone is unrivaled, it's unbelievable. So there I was in Kentucky, Chris is in LA, he did all the work remotely. He just sent me stems and it blew my mind. We'll hear some of his stuff soloed, but the guy's unbelievable. So then I had this mixture of Maggie on fiddle, Chris on cello. I thought, but what do I do for the vocal element? I wanted a straight tone soprano. That, that means a woman singing at the highest range possible, but without using vibrato. I found timbre, and timbre sings this straight tone soprano in a way that is mythical to me. It's unbelievable. But I reached out to her, I said, Tambra, I need you on a manual. What can you do? She said, I'd love, to, I'd love to help, but all I have is like a USB mic. And I said, that's fine. Here's the track. Can you riff over it? And so everything she gave me uh, did not come from a high quality studio. It came from a USB mic and, and it sounds incredible. It really challenges that idea that you need really good recording gear uh, to get a good performance. Tambra's just that good. Believe it or not, I did not pitch correct anything that Tamara gave me. She just hits these notes with complete accuracy and purity. And it was that dream team of Maggie, Chris, and Tamara that made this song so special. The last element is actually a set of 1800 sleigh bells that my dad has. They're antiques, it's a full set of crotal bells. They're made out of brass. They're numbered, they're in sequential order. They're perfectly preserved, they're in great shape. And what people used to do is strap these bells around uh, a horse's chest. And when you'd be out at night, just for security, so you didn't run into anybody else who was on the road, you'd have these bells that would kind of alert people to your presence. And these bells are very, very difficult to locate. It's difficult to find a full set. And here's my dad, who is the ultimate collector. He goes digging in the ground for some of the most incredible bottles, glass, coins that you could ever imagine. He lives up in the Northeast. And he's like, oh, I have this whole set of bells. So he shipped them to me. Once that was in place, the last element we had to address was the actual atmosphere of the song, which to me was accomplished through wind. I needed it in equal measure of the mystery, which kind of came from the bells, the strings, but then also the environment, which came from hearing wind. For some reason in Christmas music, audible wind is kind of a thing. And in the classics, you just hear this like low fidelity whistling wind. Like if you've ever seen the animated version of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they just have this whistling wind in the background all the time. And I don't know why, but I synonymize that with Christmas. Emmanuel All In took one month to produce. I worked from mid-October to mid-November of 2015. Start to finish, took me about a month. And I just uploaded it to uh, my distributor and then boom, came out the next day. And no one cared, you know, I'm, I'm not shocked by that. Uh, that's how I assume my music will be received since it's instrumental. It's already in this niche category. Um, it wasn't until years later that I saw that some Russian YouTuber had taken the track, put it on his channel, and I saw that this thing had like six or seven million views on it. And I thought, this is crazy. I didn't, I didn't understand anybody cared about this song. And here I am now learning, this is like how most of Europe knows about my music is through Emmanuel. So if you're that Russian YouTuber, shout out. If you're interested in the vinyl, uh, this is a shameless plug. We did just release a final record of Emmanuel. It's the title track. We did super high quality run. There's more music than Emmanuel on there, but that's the title track. So check it out on streaming, check it out on vinyl, and let's dig in. Let's check out the track. <laughs> 